Hi, welcome to Programming Percy, and today we will be talking about one of my favorite ways of building software. It's event-driven architecture. The difference between an event-driven architecture and a regular monolith is that usually when you have your monolith, you have one entry point to the software. You start it up and it runs and have stuff trigger each other inside. The negative part about that is they kinda, that kind of brings a coupling to the stuff that's going on. And you have to redeploy the whole monolith. With event-driven architecture instead, you leverage microservices and you have these microservices push information to each other using events. And RabbitMQ is a great way of uh, delivering these events to and between the microservices. You can see an example I've drawn here. We have a user service which sends out a customer registered event, which is sent out by the exchange. We will cover what an exchange is soon to all the services, the email service and the log service, they both receive this event because they have said that they are interested in it. This is a super great way to build software because the software, as you can imagine, becomes super flexible because each of these parts are deployed separately. So you deploy the user service and you deploy the email service. They have no connection between each other uh, whatsoever. If the user service were to go down, uh, that wouldn't affect the email service, for instance. The email service wouldn't receive any events, so there would be a coupling that way, but you could easily replace the email service without affecting any other parts. And another thing that's great, if you want to shadow deploy something, in, just try it out, you know, you can deploy a new service listening to the customer register event and just trigger an action whenever that happens and try it out. This tutorial, we will be covering RabbitMQ, we will be building two microservices which communicates using RabbitMQ. And we will take a look at different paradigms and ways of using RabbitMQ. And we will also focus mostly on RabbitMQ. So if you're here to learn RabbitMQ, great, you're in the right place. We will be building the microservices using Go because I'm a Go fanatic. But you don't have to know Go to, to follow along. And what you learn here, you should be able to uh, apply on whatever language you want. RabbitMQ supports multiple protocols for sending data. We will be focusing on AMQP in this tutorial, which is one way or the network protocol used. Uh, over the course of this tutorial, we will learn a lot. We will learn how to set up RabbitMQ using Docker. We will learn about virtual host users and permissions inside RabbitMQ. We will learn how to manage RabbitMQ using the command line tool called RabbitMQ CTL. We will also be using RabbitMQ admin to manage other stuff inside the RabbitMQ. We will learn about what producers and consumers are and how to use them. We will learn about queues, exchanges and bindings. And we will try out a few work queues. We will try pubs, publish and subscribe schemas. We will try out a RPC based pattern using callbacks. And we will also encrypt the traffic and set that up it with TLS and we'll also use configurations to declare resources in RabbitMQ. Whew, that's a lot. So we better get started. So the easiest way to start up RabbitMQ is of course using Docker. As always, Docker is the most easiest way. So let's go ahead and run a instance of RabbitMQ. I'm going to call mine dash dash name RabbitMQ. I'm going to use dash D so that it will run in the background. We need to expose uh, two ports. So 5672, 5672 is the AMQP port or connections. So you will need to bind that to, to your host machine. So let's also go ahead and bind a second port, which is the same port, but 15,000 instead. And this is the port used by the admin UI and the management UI uh, for RabbitMQ. And let's go ahead and enter the latest available uh, RabbitMQ image, which is RabbitMQ 3.11, in my case, dash management. Let's go ahead and run that. After we've ran it, we should verify that everything is working as expected. So. I do recommend that you open up a browser and you go to localhost 
and you go to the 15,672 port and you should see what I see here. You can go ahead and log in using guest, guest, guest as the username, guest as the password, and you will log into this fancy, really fancy UI. You can see a log, logout button up in the corner. I'm just going to zoom in. We have a logout button up here. So I'm just going to go ahead and log out again. RabbitMQ comes with a guest user pre-installed. We do not want to use this user and we want to remove that user. But before we do that, we're going to add our own user. Now, whenever you want to work with RabbitMQ, you use a terminal, you use a command line tool called RabbitMQ CTL. You can install this on your computer, but the easiest way since we already have RabbitMQ running in a Docker, we can execute the command line tool from that Docker. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to go, go ahead and do Docker exec or execute. You're going to insert the name of your Docker container, which we named RabbitMQ. Then followed by the command, which is RabbitMQ CTL. And if I print that, you can see it prints a bunch of information about what we can do with this command line tool. Uh, mostly it's used to manage and interact with Rabbit, the uh, RabbitMQ server. So in our case, we're going to add a user. It's as simple as running the add underscore user command. I'm zooming so you see everything. So we, we run the add user. We enter the username and then the password. Make sure to use a secure password. I'm going to use secret because it's a secret and that's super secret. So we have created our first user for RabbitMQ. Now users are usually used to limit and manage what permissions your users has. So as you can see, it also tells us to don't forget to grant permissions to this user. Because right now we have added a user, but we can't really do anything with said user because he has no permissions. Let's go ahead and make sure that our new user is a administrator. So go ahead again, Docker exec, RabbitMQ. I'm going to go ahead and run the RabbitMQ CTL. We're going to use the command set user tags. Set user tags, if we run it, you can see expects some arguments. It actually expects the username and then the tag to set. So let's go ahead and tag our user Percy as an administrator. Voila, Percy is now an administrator. We are also going to want to delete the guest user, which is by default always present. Remember that. If you don't remove that user or if you don't configure the user to not get created, your RabbitMQ server will have a guest guest user. So go ahead, Docker exe, RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ CTL, delete underscore user. And as simple as that, I'm just going to go ahead and delete the guest user. So once that's deleted, we can go back to the UI and we can enter Percy and my secret password and it should be working. If you've come this far, you have created your first user. But we're not going to play around in the UI uh, before we have changed some things. In the UI, you can see everything you need to see. How many channels there are, the queues, the exchanges, and stuff like that. You can also click on the admin administrator panel, and you can see we have one admin, and it's Percy. So that's great. There's one thing that we have to cover in RabbitMQ. You have your resources, which is channels, exchanges, etc., which we will discuss soon. These resources are contained in something called virtual hosts. So a virtual host is sort of a namespace. So you use virtual hosts to kind of limit and separate resources in a logical way. And it's called a virtual because it's done in the logical layer. It's a soft restriction between what resources can reach what resource, etc. And if you go up here to the corner, you can see virtual hosts. And there's a 
by default there's a slash re a re a virtual host which is the global one and we don't want to operate in that one we want to create our own virtual host in this case as i said again you use virtual host to group certain resources to together and restrict access on those virtual hosts let's go ahead and create our virtual host again back to the terminal and we're gonna execute the same command. We're gonna use RabbitMQ CTL again. And this time we're going to do, instead of add user, we're going to do add underscore V host, short for virtual host. And for our case, we're going to add a virtual host called customers. Now the customers virtual host will hold all, our, all of our future resources, which are related to anything working on customers. Once we have our virtual hosts, we need to make sure that we have permissions to operate on the virtual host. If I go back to the drawing board, right now we have a user called Percy and we have a virtual restriction called a virtual host, which is called customers. Now, our user Percy, he wants to communicate with the resources inside the virtual host. However, we are not allowed. We don't have the permissions. So we need to go ahead and make sure that this is possible. So back to the terminal, go ahead and do docker exec rabbitmq, rabbitmq ctl. And we do set underscore permissions. We do dash p to tell which virtual host to apply these rules to. And we're going to set permissions on customers. Then you need to specify the name of the user. Now, what follows here is a little bit of regex. So when we specify permissions, we need to specify three different permissions. And they are the configurations access. So what, can the, what are the user allowed to configure? We need to specify write permissions, which is basically on what resources are the user allowed to write. We also need to specify read permissions. So what resources are Percy allowed to read? The way we do it is by using a regex pattern, which is very common on RabbitMQ. So if you want to allow Percy to only configure resources, starting with say customer, we have to do a regex like this uh, customer dot star and this would allow Percy to configure every resource inside the virtual host of customers beginning with this name I hope that makes sense so if we want to allow Percy to configure all the resources inside this virtual host we would do dot star and that would match anything just to make it clear, if we have a queue in here, and this queue is named, hmm, let's say details. This queue is named details for some reason. If I want to allow the user Percy to configure that details, and maybe I want to allow him to write on the details. So let's go ahead and say that he is allowed, Percy is allowed to write on details, but he's only allowed to read any resources beginning on dot customers. These permissions would allow Percy user to configure the details, to write to the details, but not to read from them because this pattern doesn't match the name. I hope this makes sense. So back to the command. We need to specify these three permissions in order. I'm just going to give Percy the permission to kind of write on everything. So enter the permissions like this. I'm just going to do dot star. Three times we need to enter that. So we have the configuration, write and read permissions set. Go ahead and execute that. And it set the permissions for Percy and the virtual host of customers. 
So now I'm allowed to read, configure, and write on everything inside of that virtual host, which is great. That is what we want. So if we go back to the RabbitMQ UI, we should be able to refresh and we should see up here in the corner, we have our customers up here. We can specify, we can click on that. And we are now only viewing data related to the customer's virtual host. So I think it's time to finally start building something. And before we do, I just want to make a quick note about all the resources that we will be using, what they are, so we understand that. Because it's really important to understand each component in RabbitMQ. Now, this is a small flowchart I've drawn using RabbitMQ. And what we have is the first component, which is producers. Producers is any piece of software that is sending messages. So anyone who is sending a message is known as a producer. They produce messages. Also, we have consumers, who is any piece of software that is receiving those messages. So how do they receive the messages? Two pieces that we need to understand. We have exchange. Now, producers send their messages to a exchange. Think of the exchange as a broker now or a router. So the exchange knows which queues are bound to the exchange. Now, to bind something to an exchange, we use something called a binding. A binding is basically a rule or set of rules if the queue should receive the messages. So the exchange is bound to a queue by a set of rules. So a producer sends a message, say that the message is on the topic customers underscore registered. Now the exchange will know if a certain queue is bound on that topic and send it further along. It's really important to understand you don't send messages to the queue you send messages to the exchange, which, which then routes the messages where they should go. Now, the queue is basically a buffer for messages. It's, a, it's usually a first in, first out. So it's a FIFO queue. So basically, the messages comes in and comes out in the correct order. So message one is received. It will be the first message to go out whenever we have a consumer who wants to consume messages. We will be looking more at the bindings very shortly. So basically, this is what you need to know and the terminology that we will use. I think I'm going to go ahead and start up a Go project, which we can use to start coding. So I'm just going to open up my terminal. I'm going to clear it. And we're going to go ahead and initialize a small folder structure. Now I'm going to create the project setup first. Now I'm really used to using Cobra for my commands and um, I'm going to follow the structure that Cobra uses sort of uh, for this project. I'm inside a new folder here called event driven RQM. I'm going to go ahead and create a folder called CMD for command lines. I'm going to create the producer. And we're also going to create an internal folder for our internal libraries. Now we're going to create two files. So inside CMD producer, I'm going to create a main file for the producer program. I'm also going to create a RabbitMQ inside of the internal. So the idea here is that CMD folder will hold different commands that we can execute. In our case, we will have a microservice client known as the producer, who simply will shoot out a few messages onto an exchange. And the internal folder will hold any internal uh, code that we use amongst the services. And let's go ahead and initialize a module. So I'm gonna go ahead and name this to programmingpercy.tech event driven rabbit. We like it. We do like event driven rabbits. Uh, I'm also going to go get a RabbitMQ AMQP091, which is the official. Oh, 
sorry, not got, go get, which is the official supported client which the RabbitMQ team are supporting. So I'd recommend using that. Now you should have a folder structure looking like this. We have a CMD for our commands. We have internal code or shared libraries. We're going to go ahead and start by creating the RabbitMQ code to connect to the Docker that is running. I'm just going to go ahead and open up the RabbitMQ file that we created. So in here, we will need to create a small helper function that connects to RabbitMQ using MQP. So we'll, we, we will need to specify the credentials and the host and the virtual host to connect to. So let's go ahead and create this code. So we're going to be operating in the internal module. We're going to need to import a few things. We will need context. We will need prompt and we will need MQP which we downloaded before. So let's go ahead and create a new type. I'm going to call it the rabbit client. Basically, this will be a wrapper around the official AMQP client, which we can use to add a little bit functionality to. So I'm just going to go ahead and hold a connection to AMQP. We're also going to hold a channel to AMQP. Now, this is the connection used by the client. So we need to discuss connections and channels. So a connection in RabbitMQ is a TCP connection. And a good rule of thumb is that you should reuse the connection across your whole application and you should spawn new channels on every concurrent task that is running. So what's a channel? A channel is a multiplexed connection over the TCP connection. So think of it as a separate connection, but it's using the TCP connection that we set up on the connection. So the AMQP connection is the TCP connection. The channel is a multiplexed sub connection you could call it and that's a really good rule of thumb to just follow so let's add a comment here that channel is used to process and send messages so the first thing we need to do we need to connect to rabbitmq so let's go ahead and create a function called connect rabbitmq we will accept a username a password the virtual host the host the host and the virtual host name also. And we're going to be returning a AMQP connection. As always, an error as well. So to connect, we can use amqp.dial. Dial will accept a URL formatted in a specific URI. So let's go ahead and do font.sprintf. And the format is the protocol, which is AMQP. We will then insert the username, colon, the password, at the host. And we will follow that by slash the virtual host. So let's go ahead and insert the username, password, the host, and the virtual host as input. And these ex the output of dial we can view is a connection a, or a pointer to a connection and an error. So let's just go ahead and return that. Next up, we need to... Now, the next thing that we will do is, remember we talked about the channel being... The connection should be reused and the channel should be spawned for each instance. And if our program will be running many clients, uh, which is very common, uh, we will want to spawn that. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to do new rabbit MQ client. So this one will actually accept the connection that we received from the connect rabbit MQ function. And we will return a rabbit client 
and an error. So what we will do here is that we will take the connection and we will spawn a channel from it. And this channel will be used for this created rabbit client. Um, this will allow us to reuse the connection between multiple RabbitMQ clients. Um, so let's go ahead and do the channel and error, which will be returned when we create a channel. So connection.channel will return the channel or an error. And if error isn't nil in this case, let's return an empty rabbit client or the error. I won't be doing error wrapping and stuff here because it's really not what we will be learning today. So let's do a new client. We will hold a pointer to the connection. We will also hold the channel, which we can reuse at, at will. And let's return nil. So we can connect to RabbitMQ and we can spawn a new client Client that will hold a channel for us to reuse. And just to be good boys, let's add a function to the Rabbit client, which is close. And it will go and close the channel. Only close the channel because we don't want to close the connection in case we have other people using the same connection. Only close the multiplexed and it's going to be capital. So we also have the ability to close the channel for this particular client. So this is good. So let's jump to the producer. The first thing we will do is that we will simply connect to RabbitMQ and kind of see what's going on. Just to know that the connection works. I'm going to create a main, I'm going to create the main function and we're going to connect and we're going to call the internal module and we're going to connect to the RabbitMQ and now we need to insert the credentials which is Percy and in my case the password is secret. We're hosting it on localhost 5672 and the virtual host is named customers. Basically, we're only using the function that we just created. It will connect. And if the connection fails, I will simply panic. And once we are done with the connection, we will go ahead and close it. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, we also need to spawn the new rabbit client with the connection that we have so that we are reusing the connection. Let's go ahead. See if there's any errors and again panic and defer client dot close so we are closing the connections and let's just sleep for let's say 10 10 seconds then we will print the client just for fun and we also need to fix a few imports uh, for the time package and the log bring up a terminal and we should be able to run the producer and have a connection go up so let's go ahead go run cmd producer main.go and let's run that we will see that we didn't import context i'm just going to jump back so my bad, I imported the context package, but we're not using it currently. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove it. Then I'm going to jump back to my producer. And now I'm going to go ahead and rerun the program. And we should see that it loads. We can open up the RabbitMQ UI and we can go to the overview. And we should see here that we have one connection and one. Oh, they disappeared. I was too slow. So let's go ahead and run it again. Maybe the 10 seconds is a bit slow. I'm just going to run it again. Jump back to the UI. And you should see here that we have one channel and one connection open. So that's great. And I mean, I've got to stress this enough. Like, remember that you should recreate the channel for each concurrent task, but reuse the connection. Always have one connection for your particular service and spawn channels from that.
And the reason why you want to do that is because if you spawn connections instead, you will create so many TCP connections and that does not scale very well. So it's time to start sending data. And this can be done on the channel that we will be using. And we will begin by creating a queue. So to create a queue, remember what the queue is. We remember the queue is the FIFU buffer, which we use. So let's go ahead and create a queue. And we can do that inside of the code. If you go back to your code, any place, and we go into the where we have the channel, we can go to the channel and see there's a queue declare function, which will help us create a queue from the client. So there's a few parameters that we need to understand when we create our queue. So first of all, the queue accepts a name parameter. Basically, this is just a reference to the queue. You use that to specify what the queue is named. In our case, we will probably use something like customers. Now, you also need to specify if the queue should be durable. And a durable queue will be persisted whenever the broker restarts. So that means when RabbitMQ restarts, if you want your queue to persist, you need to set, set that to durable. Now, we can also set the auto delete parameter and a queue which is set to automatically delete will be deleted whenever the software that created it shuts down. So whenever the producer shuts down after the 10 second timeout, it will delete the queue. This is very common when you have dynamic queues being created by uh, services that you don't know of, that you don't want to, maybe they spawn differently and you don't want to clog RabbitMQ with a million queues you have to delete them. So auto delete is good for that. And you can also set the exclusive flag and the exclusive flag will make the queue only available to the connection that created it. So if we only expect the queue to be used from this particular piece of software, we can set it to exclusive. Nobody else will be able to use the queue. No way it will assume that the queue is being created on the server. So if you expect it to already exist, for instance, you should set it to true. Now it's important to understand these parameters. It's really important. And they will be reused when we create messages and exchanges. So all these things will mean the same thing later in the tutorial when we start looking at messages and exchanges. Instead of declaring this here, let's make a small little function which can help us. I'm just going to go ahead and create a new function and it will be attached to our Rabbit client and we will call it create queue. Basically, it's a simple wrapper around the current one, but we're not exposing our channel to, to the users. So so we're going to go ahead and just make this simple function. And I'm not going to be using all the parameters. I'm not going to be allowing all the parameters. I'm just going to be allowing the users to set the durable and the auto delete and the name. So the rest of them will default to false for now. And this is just to make it a little bit easier for now. Let's go ahead and reach out to the channel and do a queue declare. And once we pass in the name, we will pass in the durable and the auto delete and exclusive will set to false. I want everyone to reach this queue always. And no way it will also be set to false by default. Now we can simply return the error and we have a nice little function now in place so we need to go back to the producer and once inside the producer we will need to now create the queue so in here after we have our client after we defer it i'm just gonna go ahead and do if error i'm gonna go client create queue and i'm gonna create the customers created queue and I'm gonna set it as durable because I want it to survive. 
I am not going to make it auto delete because I want it to be there forever. And I'm going to panic if anything goes wrong. So for fun, we're also going to create a second queue, which will be customers. Mm, let's call it customer test. And this one won't be durable. And we will set it to auto delete just so we can test that out. And again, we will have it wait for 10 seconds and then log the client. Right, so we should be able to bring up the terminal and execute again. And oh, my bad. I forgot one parameter inside of the create queue. So let's go there. Inside the queue declare, there's actually one final parameter I forgot about. I'm so sorry. And it's the arguments. And this is a way of inserting options to provide to the user. And we won't be going into that now, but you can basically provide generic data, which you can use internally to manage how things work. I'm just going to leave it to nil for now. So once we have entered this, we will create our queues. Let's go ahead and open the terminal. And I'm going to clear here. I'm going to go ahead and run the producer again. I'm going to quickly jump to the GUI. You should be able to go to the queues and see that we have the customers created queue. We can have also the customer tests. You can see a little bit of features here. This is the durable, so it will survive. This one is auto delete, and so it will be removed whenever we recreate. Now, if you want to try this out to kind of get a better understanding of it, you can go back to the terminal and I guess we could do Docker restart RabbitMQ and that will restart the RabbitMQ server. And now if you've guessed right, we should, whenever we go back to the GUI, we refresh, we will only see one of the queues, the one which was durable. It's super important to remember what durable and auto delete does because it will be really important when you create your architecture for the messages. So if you want your messages to survive between restarts or crashes or when everything happens, make them durable. So we will cover this more when we see how we deal with payloads as well. It's the same principle applies to them. Now you might be thinking, let's send some messages on that queue. But do you remember what we talked about earlier? You're not sending messages on queues. We are sending messages to exchanges. So we need to explore exchanges and bindings, two very, very important parts about RabbitMQ. Sadly, I wish I could just say that it's a router and that it, that's it, but there is a few different exchanges and I just want to quickly cover them so we know what we have to work with. So exchanges are a vital part of RabbitMQ and that's why we're focusing on it. Now, to start receiving or sending messages on a queue, you need to bind that queue to an exchange. This is called the binding. The binding is basically a routing rule. So one important thing is that a queue can be bound to multiple exchanges, which makes it even more important to understand what's going on. You can even have exchanges being bound to exchanges. So, so whenever you send a message on message queue, you have to add a routing key. And the routing key, sometimes referred to as the topic, will be used by the exchange. So direct exchanges is the first and foremost and the most easy exchange that exists. So we have a producer who sends a message on a, a with a routing key called customer created. Now we have a queue called customer created. So the message will go from the exchange to that queue because the routing key is an exact match. The customer email won't get the message because the keys doesn't match. It is as simple as that. The second exchange type is a very nice one. It's called a fan out. And it's called a fan out because it's outputted to every queue present. 
the fanout will ignore the routing key. So in this case, customer created message is sent to the fanout and the fanout will send it to customer created, but also to the customer email. Because who gives a shit about the routing key? Whenever you have, whenever you have the need to deploy or broadcast messages to all the queues, no matter what, you use the fanout. And then we have the one I like the most, and it's called the topic exchange. The topic exchange allows you to create routing keys that are delimited by a dot. Now, in the example, you can see that we send messages on customers.created.february. And the exchange will then send out the messages to this rule, customers.created.hashtag, which will match any items on that topic. When using topics, uh, there's a few things that you need to understand. The dot is really important because when you, when you subscribe to topics, there's a few things, or there's actually two very special characters. You see the character here, the, the hashtag. The hashtag means zero or more matches. So for example, customers.hashtag will match here because there's one or more match, zero or more matches. But we also have the star, which is customers.star, which will match anything inside that dot. And then maybe February. This will also match because we're listening to any event that occurred on February, not only created, maybe customer deleted on February could also be possible. So the topic exchange really allows you to create binding rules which you can use for this now this is very common so you could for instance have this customers created dot february or one other one other very uh, common thing is maybe you want all the users from stockholm so you would publish to the customers created stockholm or maybe G uh, Europe.Stockholm to even narrow it down because maybe some customers from some countries have these specific rules that you need to apply. Maybe they need an email stating that they are now signed up. So you could use the topic to kind of have these very dynamic routes being set and even help you with knowing what kind of data it comes from. And then, of course, uh, there's the final, which is the header exchange. Now, when sending messages in RabbitMQ, we are allowed to add headers, uh, which is basically these key value fields. And you can add um, routing based on the header. So for instance, if you have independent of the routing key, you have maybe all your messages adds a header for Linux. Maybe you consider Linux users to be scary. Why are there Linux using Linux users using your system? Uh, maybe you want to get notified on those. So each message gets a header set which their user agent and you can then uh, listen to those messages. So it's very good, very good. But let's stop talking about exchanges and let's create one instead. To create exchanges, we can use the RabbitMQ admin command, command line tool instead if previously we used the RabbitMQ CTL, but there is also the RabbitMQ admin. You can create queues inside of the code. It kind of depends on what you like to do. I like to have my exchanges created beforehand, so I know what exchanges exists. But you could do this in the code as well. But to get some practice using RabbitMQ admin, let's go ahead. Now, open up a terminal. And we will do, so wait, that terminal is so small. Okay, let's do it. So we do docker exec, rabbitmq, rabbitmq admin. We want to use the declare command because we want to declare a resource. We want to declare a exchange. We will specify the virtual host use, which is customers. And then 
we need to specify the kind of exchange we want. In my case, we will be using the topic for now. We will set the user and we will use set the password. This is used to authenticate to RabbitMQ. You need to do this. Also, let's make it durable. True. So let's run that. And we will see that the name. All right. We need to specify a name for the exchange. Of course. Let's call it customer events as in the example. Let's run that. And you should see exchange is declared. So that's great. We have the we have the exchange called customer events where we can start pushing data. Uh, however, we need to also set permissions uh, for this. Right now, the user we are using first, he doesn't have permissions to send data to the customers. So let's go ahead and fix that. Let's do Docker exec RabbitMQ RabbitMQ CTL set topic permissions. So this is a new command used to set topic permissions. We're going to set topics on the virtual host of customers. And we're going to set the permissions for the user Percy. And we're going to set the permissions for the exchange called customer events. Now we need to specify the read and write permissions. So this is the same as we did before. And we're going to allow our user to read and write any messages starting with customers dot star. So basically anything sent on the customers will be able to be read. So customers dot star and let's change that. So basically if the exchange customer events would send billing information on billing dot whatever topic, the Percy user wouldn't be able to listen on those because we are only allowed to listen on any topic called customers dot whatever. All right, we have the exchange up and running. Let's take a look at how we can start publishing messages onto the exchange. Now, we need to go back to the RabbitMQ client. We need to create a new function that allows us to create bindings. Because remember, we need to bind the queues that we have created to the exchange. So we're going to create a new function here. And we're going to call it create binding. And it's going to be a simple wrapper again. We're going to accept the binding key, the routing key, and the exchange name and the name to use for the binding. And we will simply return an error. So there is a function on the channel which is called QBind. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So RC, the channel, QBind, it takes a name, the routing key to use, and the exchange, uh, the no weight and some arguments. Let's go ahead, let's add the name, let's add the binding and the exchange. We will set it to false, the no weight. We're leaving no weight to false because having no weight set to false will uh, make the channel, will make the channel return an error if it fails to bind. So I like that. And again, the final argument is extra options. We don't really need them. Let me go ahead and write a comment here. If you guys are wondering why I'm getting errors sometimes in the side, it's because I don't uh, comment the code properly. I'm using revive and it doesn't like me not commenting the code. It's not actually errors, but you know, it's a good, it's good that it points it out. So the create bind will bind the current channel to the, the given exchange using the routing key provided. Great. So now that we have this functionality, we need to go back to the producer 
and after we have created our queues we will go ahead and uh, call the create binding and we will create the customers created the name of the queue that we want to bind maybe i didn't say that the name is the name of the queue that we want to bind and then comes the binding key or the topic let's say we want customers dot created dot stars dot star as we had in the example and then we need to provide the name of the exchange and the exchange was named customer underscore events then let's see if there's any errors and again let's simply panic if something goes wrong we're not doing proper error handling here because that's not really what we're trying to learn today so let's go ahead and copy that let's redo the um, let's copy that and recreate another binding for the test and instead we will do customers dot everything maybe so that's amazing now we can try this just to see that the binding does work so we can clear this and we can do go run run the producer and we're getting some messages did i mess up the name oh my bad inside the create binding function we also need to make sure that the input arguments are strings so let's go ahead let's rerun the program now and i'm gonna jump to my ui we can see them we can see the queues are here so we can click on the queue and we can actually see a binding you can view the binding here customer events is bound by this routing key and you can also of course unbind or even create bindings inside the ui i like to do it in the code it's more apparent it's more reusable but sometimes when testing things the ui is really great for just you know kind of adding a quick binding if you want to consume or listen in on the messages now that we have the bindings let's start publishing messages we are, have bound the queues to the exchange we can now start sending messages i will create a new wrapper function i like wrapper functions if you haven't noticed uh, just sort of making it easier to reuse and reducing the boilerplate code let's call it send and this time we're actually going to insert the context so re-add that import we're going to whenever we send messages we have to provide the exchange and the routing key that we want to send the message on and also something called options which we will look at soon the options are really important but let's leave them hanging for a bit so the exchange and the routing key will be strings we will accept uh, options from amqp they have a struct for it and it's called publishing and amqp publishing holds all the options that you can apply to the message that you're sending so let's go ahead and return an error if something goes wrong so to send messages we use the channel again always the channel so let's return channel rc channel and then we're using publish with context uh, i like to use publish with context but because that allows us to add timeouts to the messages etc so we don't just leave the code hanging forever let's go ahead and take a look at the input parameters that the publish with context kind of expects just, just gonna go here so it expects the context the exchange name the key, routing key and mandatory immediate and the message the first two we know what they are the exchange and routing key so let's just go ahead and do exchange and we are also adding the routing key but then comes the mandatory mandatory is used to determine if 
a failure should simply drop the message that you're sending or if it should return an error. If you leave mandatory as false, you won't get an error. It will fire and forget. If you set it to true, it will make sure that if it failed to publish the message to the exchange or the queue, it will return an error. It's used to determine if an error should be returned upon failure. So that's important to remember. Also, we have the immediate flag, immediate, and you can just leave that to false because you will never use that if you're using this package. Um, because immediate is actually removed in RabbitMQ 3 and up. So unless you're using an old version of RabbitMQ, this is actually deprecated. Just leave it hanging. And then the last thing it wants is the options and the options will be the actual message that we're sending and again if you take a look at publish with context you will see it returns an error so we can simply return whatever we get back from the publish so this is a super simple super super simple wrapper function uh, publish payloads onto an exchange with the given routing key let's do the interesting part let's go back to the publisher this is becoming one giant function but bear with me this is in learning purposes we won't build a nice structure around this so let's publish uh, messages one on each queue just to see a few differences the reason why we're doing this is because we want to discuss something called the delivery mode and this is a really important parameter to understand. Uh, if you want to have your messages persist, that means if you send a message and no consumer consumes it and your server restarts, that message will be deleted if it's not a persistent message. And those messages are called transient. So why would you not want your messages to be persistent? Well, it's, it's a matter of performance and also up to you to decide, is there any reason? Like if, you're, uh, if, there's, if there's no reason that the event will happen if the server comes up, for instance, there's no reason to persist it. And then they should be transient to increase performance because making things durable in RabbitMQ, there will be overhead to it. Uh, also remember, if you're trying to send persistent messages, your queue also needs to be durable. There is no point sending persistent messages on a queue that isn't persistent itself. Because it, if the queue isn't there, then your message, yeah, you understand. So let's go ahead. Let's send some messages. Let's begin by creating the context that we will use. So context cancel. We will do context with timeout and we will create a new context and we will say five seconds that should be reasonable a reasonable amount of time to wait and after five seconds we will cancel since we're using publish with context this will also cancel the publish function so let's go ahead and do if error equals client dot send as in the context, the exchange is customer events. And let's uh, send a message to customers.created.us. Let's have a US customer created. Now, the options is the actual message that we're sending. So let's go ahead and do AMQP publishing amqp dot publishing and we need to create the actual uh, message that we are publishing now you need to set the content type of the message this could be json binary or plain text in our case let's use let's just use plain text for now we want to specify the delivery mode as we discussed so delivery mode 
should be persistent for this one. And you can see there is transient and persistent. Let's leave it as persistent. We want this message to survive. Then there's the actual body. And in the body, we will send a byte array. It has to be a byte array. So let's say a cool message between services. This is the message that we will send. Then let's also check if the error isn't nil, we will panic. And we need to make sure to end the, with a semicolon. So we're trying to send a message onto the customer's event exchange with the key customers created US. Let's go ahead and send a transient message as well. Just so we can view the differences. Let's copy that. Let's go here. Let's insert. And let's make a comment sending a transient message. Let's see, we want to send the message on the same exchange, but let's instead send it on customers tests. Remember we bound customers dot star, so it should be bound to this. But let's change this from transient to or persistent to transient. Uncool undurable message just so we know what is what we can go to the terminal and execute the producer once again now if we visit the ui we should be able to go to the queues we can actually see that a message is sent you can see that both of them has a message sent and you can go inside here if you want to try it out so remember to just make sure that if you acknowledge the message, the message will be gone. So you can do knock and you can get the message and you should be able to see that this was a cool message sent. Again, to show you the difference now, remember that we sent one message that was persistent and one message that was transient. What we could do is we could do docker restart RabbitMQ. Now, whenever we restart this, we should see that one of the messages is actually gone whenever it starts up. So let's go back. We can go back to the queue. We can go back to the customers created queue and we can see there's one message still being ready because we told it to be persistent. And this is important to remember. If you wanna want your messages to be alive across restarts, make sure you set the delivery mode to persistent. Uh, if you only want the messages to be shut, shut out and don't care if they are actually consumed, set them as transient. So we know how to publish messages, but this is no good to us if we cannot consume the messages in another service. Let's go ahead and fix that. So inside the command, Folder. I'm going to create a new folder called consumer. Consumer is going to hold a main.go file, which we will be using to consume messages. Uh, so before we fix the consumer, we need to actually create a second wrapper again. And this wrapper will consume messages. So again, there is some parameters that we will need to learn. Let's call it consume. And we will accept the queue name. We will accept the consumer string. And the consumer string is a unique identifier for the consumer. It's used to consume a queue. Consumer will be this unique identifier uh, we can use to say that this is this particular service, uh, etc. Uh, we will also accept a parameter called auto ac auto acknowledge is used to acknowledge messages basically the way it works in um, rabbitmq is that if you have a user send a message to an exchange say that this is an exchange he sends a message to and that message is sent on a queue to a client this client receives the message 
the exchange needs to know that the service that wanted the message actually received it. And the way RabbitMQ solves this is that an acknowledge is sent back to the exchange saying, hey, I got the message and then it will, the exchange will know that it can drop the message. So that's important to understand that we have to acknowledge messages and auto -ac will make sure that our code, whenever it receives the message, will send out an acknowledge to the exchange. It's a little bit tricky with auto -ac because it is amazing, it helps you, but sometimes it's tricky. If you have a consumer that acknowledges the message but then fails, that message will get lost because the server has delivered it, it has done its job. So you might not always want auto -ac. Sometimes you want to say that you want to acknowledge the message manually whenever your service is done processing that message. We will return a channel holding AMQP delivery, which is a structure and also an error. Let's go ahead and return the RC channel. It has its own consume function, which accepts the queue name, the consumer identity, the auto act parameter, remember to use that in the right way. If you have a service which does a lot of processing, might take some time and can fail, don't auto act unless you're sure that's what you want. There's also the exclusive parameter. Exclusive parameter can be true or false. And if it's set to true, then that means that this will be the one and only consumer consuming that queue. If it's set to false, the server will distribute messages using a load balancing technique. So if you only want, if you have one consumer that you want to consume all the messages, set exclusive to true. In this example, we're just gonna default false and we're not even gonna let the user uh, to pass in anything else because we don't want that. No local is actually not supported in RabbitMQ. It's supported in MQP, but not in RabbitMQ. So the field is used to avoid publishing and consuming from the same domain. So in case you have uh, two servers maybe, and you only want one of the servers to publish or consume, you can have the no local set to true. But again, it's not supported in RabbitMQ, but just so you know what it is. No wait, won't wait for the server to confirm. And again, we'll set this to nil. And then the arguments that we can add is extra arguments. We will leave them to false for now. So we have our consume message. Let's build the consumer. So I'm gonna go ahead, jump back to the consumer. I'm gonna go package main, function main. And again, we want to connect. And actually we want to do the same thing as we do in the publisher. I'm just gonna go to the publisher, scroll up, I am going to copy the code here and I'm going to paste it inside the consumer because we will be doing the same thing. Also, we will want to import the packages that we use. So connect to the client, create a client, and then we will need to start consuming messages. So let's do message bus, let's accept an error. Let's do MQ client dot consume oh sorry client dot consume and we want to consume customers created and we want to name this oh my bad i misspelled client.consume let's call this service email service because this service will accept them and send emails now Let's not auto acknowledge. Let's leave that to false. We will look into that uh, as I explained earlier. Um, let's just panic if something goes wrong when starting the consumption. Now, for now, let's uh, make sure that we just consume forever. So I'm just going to create a blocking channel. It's going to accept empty structs. I'm going to start a go routine, which will run in the background consuming 
any message that we get from the message bus. So let's just log that print line. Let's do new message and let's print the message like that. Then let's print a little nice text down here consuming, consuming to close the program. Program press control dot C to exit and let's block forever. So let's Let's try consuming on blocking, which will, of course, then run forever. So we have nothing sending messages on this channel. So this will actually lock and block because we will never receive anything on it for now. So this is actually great. Let's uh, open up a terminal again and let's go ahead and uh, run the consumer. Remember, we should have a message in the pipe on, on the queue. So, OK, sorry. Oh. Oh, my bad. I entered the wrong queue name. So I did cons customers dash. It should be customers underscore. So let's go ahead and run it. And we should see a message being consumed. That is great. We are consuming messages. And as you can see, there's a lot of data being printed here. Uh, and it's not in a very nice format. And what we can do is we can rerun the consumer. The same message will be received over and over because we're never acknowledging to the server that we consume the message. If RabbitMQ never receives an acknowledgement, it won't drop the message unless it expires. You can set the expiry time in one of the options. So we're never acknowledging the message. So it will kind of simply just be there forever. We can do one interesting thing. Actually, if we go to the consume, we can jump to the AMQP delivery and go visit that struct. Because I like going into the libraries to see what's going on, what options we have. Now, as you can see, there's a bunch of fields, the content type, the delivery mode set, correlation ID, which is really important to understand because you can use that to understand how the message correlates to what messages are sent for. We can see the exchange it came from, the routing key, and a bunch of other stuff about the message. And you can also see the acknowledger, and the acknowledger is used to acknowledge the messages. So let's go back to the consumer. Just to show what's going on, we can see here. Let's go ahead and acknowledge the message whenever we are done processing it. So this is important to understand because um, you will want to do this when you have long running processes or whatever that you want to be retried in case they fail. So I'm just going to go ahead and do acknowledge. Multiple will acknowledge many messages at the same time, but we will set that to false for now. Let's just see if it returns an error. We will log error print line if something goes wrong. Acknowledge message failed. We won't really care about the error for now. Let's simply continue if something goes wrong. And then after we have continued, let's simply do printf acknowledge message and let's print out the ID of the message because that can be important to understand and know what's going on. So we will accept the message and this time we will actually acknowledge it. This means we will never see it again. So let's open up the terminal. Let's close the program. Let's run it. And you can see it acknowledged the message. Let's close it. Let's rerun. And this time we won't receive it. We have already acknowledged it. I really want to do this to really push on the point that auto acknowledge can be dangerous. It might have the eff an effect that you don't want. What we can do is inside this program, we can run the producer once again to have it send a message to the consumer. This time, I really just want to highlight how dangerous it is with AutoAC. So this time, let's remove the, the acknowledgement from the code. I'm just going to comment out the code block where we send the acknowledgement. And I'm going to change AutoAC from false to true. And then 
here inside the code, we will panic. Go ahead, let's run the consumer. We accepted the message, we had a crash. Now you might expect if you run the code again, it would rerun the message. But auto acknowledgement has been sent to the server as soon as you receive the message. I hope I've really made it clear why auto -ac can be dangerous, but also very handy if used in the correct way. So what do you do when there's an actual failure and you kind of want RabbitMQ to know about that? Well, instead of sending an ACK, we can send a NOCK, which will tell RabbitMQ that it actually failed to process. So when using NOCK, we can tell RabbitMQ to uh, retry and requeue the message. So should RabbitMQ try sending it out again? or should throw it away. So knocking is really important to understand and to be able to use. Let's go ahead, jump back to the code. Let's remove the auto knock. And this time let's update the code so that we will uh, throw any message the first time that they arrive. It doesn't really make much sense, but for practice, it's pretty good. So the message actually has a field called redelivered. What this means is you can view redelivered if the message is appearing for a second time. And what we can do is instead of message.ack, we can do message.knock. And again, multiple is the same as ack if you want to do multiple messages at once, but we don't. You might want to do multiple if you have a high volume of traffic. And what the RabbitMQ will do then is that the client will sort of buffer a few messages before sending the ACKs, uh, which can help reduce the network load a little bit. So the requeue is the second parameter. And this is basically if, uh, if the server should retry sending the message out again. And let's go ahead and set that as true. And then let's make sure we continue. Then down here, we're going to check if we can do message doc instead. So let's acknowledge here and log print line. Let's just do fail to arc message. So also noticed I told you guys to print out message.id but we're not setting message id to anything so it's kind of empty just so you know that. Let's see what are we complaining about print line. So if we do this now we will uh, make sure that each message is actually first knocked and then approved. So we can run the consumer, go run. Let's run the producer to make sure we have an event to actually send out. And then let's do go run consumer main.go. And we can see that we got the message. And the second time, we print it, we actually acknowledge it. So the first time we're skipping it, the second time we're acknowledging it. This is how you manage in RabbitMQ your approvals or disapprovals, your ox or nox, basically. So whenever your service fails, you can send it back a knock to the RabbitMQ exchange telling it to, hey, you might want to retry this. Right now, our code is kind of messy because everything is single threaded. We can only receive one message at a time currently. So I think we should implement a quick little fix to change this so we can try a little bit more advanced examples. So I will be adding an error group to the code. You will need go 1.2 or above to do to use the error groups. If you haven't used error groups in Go, you should really try it out. They are amazing. Um, they are available in the golang.org xsync error group package. I'm just going to go ahead and kind of re-update this code uh, so that we're using them instead. So let's remove all that code. So let's make sure. Let's create a context. So we will set a timeout for 15 seconds per task. And this is if you have long running tasks. So let's create a new context that we can use. Let's create a context with a timeout. So that will be context with timeout. Basically, what we're doing here is that we're saying 
okay whatever task you're running if 15 seconds has elapsed we want to cancel and we will also create a error group and the error group comes from this package the it's in the experimental packages so far but it's really i mean if you haven't tried it you should really do it so let's create a new one and apply our context to it now error groups allows us to set concurrent tasks now we will be setting the amount of concurrency in in go right now but we can also do this inside of RabbitMQ. we will look at that later so let's set a limit of 10 concurrent go routines at the same time and let's spawn a go funk which will run and then inside here we will loop through the messages same as we did before but instead of handling the message we will spawn a worker so here you could have your handler we need to do that to avoid uh, we need to assign a new variable to avoid over overriding message each run your id should be complaining if you don't do that so what you do with uh, a error group is that you do error group dot go which will spawn a new go routine and run your function here and it will handle all the concurrency stuff for you so it's really easy to use so let's do log.printf new message because we want to see all the new messages that we got that we get let's make them sleep for 10 seconds so we're creating a long running process here now after 10 seconds we kind of want to acknowledge the message so this will make sure that we have a process which runs for a long time and let's just print it let's return the error and if everything su succeeds we want to do acknowledged message and let's add a print let's do the message message id again we can add that to the message and then whenever we succeed we want to return nil and let's see we're running 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 we need to import the time package or the time module sorry and once we are done with that also i removed the blocking channel so let's re-add that and then here in the end let's re-add the print line use control.c to exit then let's block forever so let's go ahead run it make sure it works so it's consuming great hopefully uh, this wasn't too advanced so we create the error group we set a limit for 10 messages at a time and then we just makes a loop that runs forever and each message that we receive we spawn a go routine which will wait for 10 seconds and then execute so this allows us to listen for multiple messages at the same time there's a reason why we're implementing this again let's update the publisher as well so the publisher is a little bit too friendly right now let's go ahead and wrap the sending so we want to send more than one message so i'm just going to create a small little for loop here which kind of sends 10 messages and then exits wrap that and let's do some indenting so wrap the publisher with a for loop that sends 10 messages instead just so that we see a little bit more what's going on and let's remove the time.sleep because we don't need that anymore because i want to showcase one little thing here i'm also going to add a terminal here and once they are all in the same folder i'm going to be running two consumers and then one publisher so let's go ahead and do cmd consumer main.go i'm starting that one up and let's move up 
to the next terminal, let's start a second consumer. So I have two consumers running, and then I'm going to go ahead and run the producer uh, in another terminal. So we should see a lot of messages being printed. After a while, you can see that each of the services acknowledges five messages. Because right now, we're sending the messages to the consu consumers. It, it won't send all 10 messages to all the consumers because we haven't set that up. It's right now we have registered uh, what we call workers. So we publish 10 messages and those 10 messages will be load balanced out onto the listeners or onto the consumers that are registered, which is why we went through the hustle of uh, changing all this because I wanted to show you this. Maybe you noticed uh, the servers actually acknowledge. Uh, oh, that's a consumer. If I run the producer, you can see the producer kind of exits right away. It sends the messages and then exits. So what about if we want the producer to actually wait until the server is done? Because we, we know that the messages takes 10 seconds to complete, uh, but the producer doesn't care. It sends the messages and forgets about them. Well, sometimes we kind of want to wait and see what's going on in the producer, because if it failed, maybe the producer want to do something else. So we can actually change that really easy. So let's go into the client.send. Now we are using publish with context. There's actually another function called publish with deferred deferred confirm with context that's a long name publish with deferred confirm with context now a deferred confirm will allow the function to return a object with information about the message that was produced or sent we cannot uh, re simply return here anymore because now we are accepting a confirmation and an error so the message is the same, we can just leave that, but down here we want to add, we want to check if error not equals nil, and we want to return the error, but we also want to block, and we can do that with the confirmation, so confirmation.wait will actually block until we receive information from the server. And let's return a nil if everything goes fine. Now, this won't wait until the work is completed, but it will at least wait until the server acknowledges that it has received the messages. I hope this makes a little bit sense. Uh, so now our hub producers will actually wait for information about what's going on. This function will always return nil on confirmation if the queue isn't set to something called confirm mode so we need to enable confirm mode let's go ahead and do that so the way we enable confirm mode is that we go up to where we actually create the channel so going to new rabbit mq client where we spawn the channel and then let's put the channel in confirm mode so call the function confirm it's passing false because we don't want to wait, which is again, it's the no wait. So same as before, it will wait for the server, but we don't want that. So if we cannot put it into confirm mode, in our case, we will want to return an error because now we're using the deferred send and we will want to wait for that. So to see what's going on, let's add a print line to the confirm. Let's then jump back to the terminals that we have and let's produce some messages. Oh, my bad. We haven't imported log. I'm just going to go ahead and import log module. I'm going to go back, execute the producer. And now you see each time the message is um, confirmed, then we print true because that's what happened. Now, I want to be very clear. This is not the same as when the consumer acknowledges the message. This is when the server acknowledges that it has published the message on the exchange. They are different, 
but it's good to know. And this way, with the deferred confirm, we can actually make sure that the message we sent is actually sent and the server has accepted it. So that's why you want to do with deferred confirm sometimes. If it's really important that the message is uh, actually produced. So up until this point, we have only been using FIFO queues. First in, first out. That's the reason why each consumer is receiving five messages each because they're load balanced on the exchange. But what if you want all the consumers to receive all the messages? What if you want a pub sub schema to be used, for instance? So in a publish and subscribe schema, you want all the consumers to receive all the same messages. So if you are interested in customer registered or customer created, you want all those messages. You don't want to load balance them. To do this, we will use a fan out exchange. The fan out exchange, as explained before, will skip everything regarding the topics or the routing key, it will just push the messages out to all the consumers. So whenever you want to do publish and subscribe, you use a fan out. And fan outs are a great example when creating queues inside of the code is uh, perfect because you will have a dynamic set of consumers, so they should be creating their own queue because the fan out exchange won't care. Uh, as long as there's a queue, it will receive the message. So let's go ahead and do that. We are going to start by actually deleting the current exchange because it's the wrong type. So go ahead and do docker exec rabbit mq. We're going back to the rabbit mq admin. We're going to use delete exchange. We're going to pass in the name, which is customer events. We're going to pass in the virtual host, which was customer. And we're going to authenticate the user, uh, the, the administrator user. So we have the user Percy and we have our password. And the virtual host is going to be customers. So let's pass that in. So we want to delete the exchange customer events on the virtual host of customers. And once that's done, done we need to redeclare a new exchange. So let's redeclare an exchange. You cannot, um, if you have an exchange like customer events, you cannot change the type. You have to delete it and uh, redeploy it because, uh, yeah, well, they are in unchangeable. So let's go ahead, let's redeploy an exchange on the virtual host customers. The name will be the same as before. Don't want to edit all the code. So let's deploy that and let's use the type fan out this time we will use the user percy we will authenticate and we will also make sure that the exchange is durable i want it to survive between restarts this time uh, again we need to also update the permissions so docker exec rabbitmq rabbitmq ctl set underscore topic permissions this is the same as before we want to use the virtual host customers and the name percy and we want the exchange customer events now we're going to apply full permissions for everything we have created the exchange we need to go back to the code and we actually need to go to the create queue create queue function and make a few modifications. We don't know the name of the queue when we create unnamed queues, which we will be go doing now. But we need to modify this. So we need to actually make sure that the function queue declare actually returns a queue. So let's go ahead and make sure we accept the parameter out. Let's do some error checking here. And if error isn't nil, we will be returning a empty amqpq so like that and we will update so that we return the queue that is created for us but we also need to change the output parameters we will be returning a amqp 
Q and an error. Let me just make sure that it's on Q and not a pointer. It's a Q, so perfect. So the reason why we want to take the Q that is declared for us is because if we declare queues they without a name they will have a, a uniquely created name by RabbitMQ. So if we pass in a blank name RabbitMQ will make up a name for the queue for us. And in this case that's what we want. Let's jump to the producer or the publisher. We need to update him because we have updated the create queue. One thing that we need to change is that we need to change who is creating the queue. So in a publish and subscribe, it's most likely the subscriber who will be creating the queue because the publisher won't know what queues exist. Let's simply remove this from the publisher. The publisher will no longer be creating the queues or no longer be creating the bindings. So just remove that from the producer and it should be looking like this now. For the sake of it, we can also remove the customer test event because we don't need that anymore. We know that works. So this is the new producer. It's much slimmer. So we have removed a lot of code from that. Sadly, we need to move that code into the consumer. Let's go back to the consumer. And inside the consumer, we will be creating the queue and we will accept an error. So we will do client create queue. We will pass in an empty value for the name because we do not care about the name. We will be generating random names. You may, you can use known names, but usually when you have publish and subscribes, you, you, you might end up with many subscribers and you don't know the subscribers. So you might as well have the code generated, but it's up to you right now. The reason why we want to return the queue is because in the consumer, when we create the binding, we need the name. Since this is an unknown name, let's do client create binding. Use the randomly generated name for us. The binding can be empty because this is a fan out. We no longer care about um, the binding. We will simply receive all the messages on this exchange. We have created the queue and we have bound the queue using a fan out exchange, which is customer events. This will allow this client to receive all of the events that are produced. So before we try this out, we need to take the consume part of the code and we need to push that down a little bit. So put the consume at the bottom. So we create the queue, we create the binding, and then we start consuming the queue. So let's consume the queue. Let's use the randomly generated name. Everything else should stay, stay the same. Let's go into our terminals. Let's clear them and let's run the consumers. I'm starting both consumers. Let's clear that one. So we are running both consumers and let's run the producer. And this time we will see that all the 10 messages are sent to both consumers. So I hope you see the difference here and why we went through all this hassle. The direct solution will make all the clients receive one message or five messages because it will send an equal amount split the workload across the consumers. That might not be what you want if, you use, if you're expecting a publish and subscribe. In the case where you want all the consumers to receive all the messages, you should use a fan out. So the publish and subscribe really pushes the data out to everyone listening. Now, there's another thing that is very common when using RevitMQ, and that's building on kind of RPC system, remote call procedure. And the way that works is you have the producer send a reply to, and the reply to is the name of a queue that the producer is listening on. Each message is sent with this reply to, and the email service knows whenever he is done, he will reply to that queue. And we will see how we can implement that. 
it's actually not too much. It's actually pretty easy. However, we will be needing to go back to the terminal here. I'm just going to go ahead and grab my Docker exec MQ, Rabbit MQ admin. I'm going to take the declare exchange command that we ran previously, but I'm going to modify it a bit. This time, we're going to create a direct type. So the same command, but it's going to be a direct type. And the name of the exchange is going to be customer callbacks. So execute that. Then we need to fix the permissions. So I'm just going to go back, docker exit, use the Revit MQ CTL to set the topic permissions. We're going to set the topic permissions on customers for Percy on customer callbacks. So customer callbacks. That allows Percy user to you do whatever he wants on the customer callbacks. So before we start doing this, because now we're actually going to start consuming and publishing in the same program. And at that point, it's really important that we cover one other rule of thumb that is super important. Before we said that you should reuse your connections, but that is only true if you're publishing and consuming on that channel, if you're doing both at the same time, which we will be doing in an RPC because we will pro be producing messages and we will also be listening on the callback. So we will be both consuming and producing. You should never do that on the same connection. Never. Why, you might ask? Because if you have a producer which is spamming a lot of messages, he is spamming more messages than the server can handle. This means that the TCP connection will start accumulating too many messages and RabbitMQ will apply back pressure. Back pressure will start storing messages in a backlog. The consumer who wants to send an acknowledgement to the server will suffer from the same back pressure. So the back pressure will actually stop the consumer from telling the server that it has processed a message and that will just make the whole pipeline clogged up so an important rule of thumb never use the same connection for publishing and consuming in the cases where you have software like in the rpc we should create two connections so two connections one for consuming one for publishing so let's go back to the producer we will create two connections now instead. One will be used for publishing and one will be used for consuming. We will keep using the unnamed queues and we will also add a reply to to the messages. So let's copy this piece of, piece of code down here. But we will call this the consume connection. All consuming will be done on this connection. And we will defer consume on close instead copy this part where we create a client as well and we will call him the consume client let's not forget to change the connection we pass in to consume con instead and then also let's close consume client so I hope this makes sense. One connection for reading, one for writing. Now, whenever we send a message, we will expect a callback. So we send a message and the consumer does something and then we will want the response from that consumer. So what we need to do is we need to create a queue. So let's go ahead and create the queue. We will use an unnamed queue. We will make it persist. We will check if there's any errors. And if there's any errors, we will panic. We will need to bind this queue. So let's do consume client. We're creating the binding on the consume client because it's related to consuming. We will pass in queue name and the binding will be the queue name because this is a direct exchange. Remember that. A direct exchange we will only receive routing keys that match our binding exactly and then for the exchange 
it's customer callbacks. Let's check if there's any error. Error not equals nil, then let's panic. And then let's also start consuming. So we have message bus, error, consume client dot consume. We consume the queue name. Let's call it the customer API. Because it makes sense that you would have a customer API kind of push a new member to register on your website or whatever. And then you kind of expect a callback to notify the user if it was successful or not. Let's go ahead, create a GoFunk. I'm not going to be creating multiple uh, routines here. Uh, we're just going to use a single threaded reader. So let's just print the messages, I suppose. Message callback. And we're going to use the correlation ID this time. So let's do that. And then at the bottom, after we have sent, let's create a blocking channel again. Same as in the consumer. And let's just block. So the producer is creating the queue and waiting for a callback on that queue. But we also need to tell the consumer which queue we are waiting for or where, where we want the message. And this is actually built into RabbitMQ or MQP. So we can specify the reply to field. And let's just pass in the name here. When whoever receives this message will also know where they should publish the response. Let's also add a correlation ID. Correlation ID is used to track and know which event the messages relates to. So let's just do pumped.sprintf and I'm going to let's just call this the customer created and this is bad, but let's just add the integer for now. So each message that is published has a reply to and a correlation which can be used to further along control the messages. We need to make sure that the consumer also have two connections because now the consumer will also publish messages back. I'm going to go and force you to copy again. We're going to do the same thing, but this time we're going to name it the publish connection. Uh, you could probably fix so it's the same in both pieces, but um, and so we need to do the same for the client. Make sure that we have a second client and it's going to be the publish client and we're going to pass in the publish connection to the publish client. Publish connection to the publish client and let's also close the publish client like that. Now we are already creating the queues here. These are the same as before. We don't have to change that. We're not sending a message back at all. Let's go here before or after we acknowledge. So let's say we are done here in this process. So we're going to use the publish client to send back the callback. Now this service has done its task. So let's do client.send. Let's pass in. Do we have a con let's just reuse the same context. We're going to send the callback to the customer callbacks exchange. So when, when we are replying, we are replying to the queue sent inside of the message.reply, which is the mess queue name that we gave from the producer. So we're responding to the same queue that we were given. Let's go ahead and create a AMQP publishing. And we need to add some data. So let's make, sh let's set the content type. And the content type will be text of plain. The delivery mode will be AMQP persistent. 
the body will contain the text RPC complete, which is really creative. But this is just again to show what's going on. So let's do let's re-add the correlation ID to the struct so the consumer can backtrace to what message he got a response to. Because if you don't add the correlation ID, the producer when he receives the callback he won't know which id to relate it to so that's why you really pass the correlation back and forth if we go back now and we go back to the consumers and we restart them and we restart this consumer we should be able now to run the producer and that should generate callbacks to the producer after a few seconds and we should get the response back and print those. We can see here that everything seems to be working. We are getting the responses back. So message callback, customer created, zero. But now we have an RPC pattern. We have a producer sending a message to a consumer waiting for a response. And it's just amazing. So one thing we should look at before we move on is actually do you remember the hacky way we limited the amount of data we should be able to send? We used a error group in Go to do that. But actually we wouldn't have to because there's a way of imposing limits, limits inside of RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ allows us to set something called a prefetch limit. Now a prefetch limit tells the ser server, the RabbitMQ server, how many unacknowledged messages it can send on one channel at a time. And this way we can set something called a hard limit so we don't DDoS a service. This is something RabbitMQ refers to as a quality of service. So let's see how we can modify RabbitMQ to use this quality of service. So we're gonna go back to the RabbitMQ client and we're going to create a new function which will be called RC RabbitMQ client. And we're going to apply Q quality of service. So let's call it QoS. Actually, apply QoS will accept a few parameters. We will accept the prefetch count. And the prefetch count is an integer on how many unacknowledged messages the server can send. And we have the prefetch size. Let's zoom that in. We have the prefetch size, and that is an integer of how many bytes the queue can have before we are allowed to send more. And then we also have the global flag, which determines if the rule should be applied globally or not. So those are the input parameters that we need to account for. So count size integers and global is a boolean and we will return an error. So let's do return rc the channel qos and let's just insert the count, the size and the global. This allows us to set the limit to the RabbitMQ server instead. To our and that's great because that allows us to more easily limit how many messages. And this is great to do because you avoid cl uh, cluttering your network and spamming one service until it goes down. So this is kind of important to apply. And I really recommend that you do it. So go back to the consumer. We can simply just do uh, client dot apply let's say 10 messages, zero bytes. Zero bytes will be ignored, so don't worry about that. If you don't put any bytes, it will ignore it. Apply a, we have applied a hard limit on the server. So that's great. Now the server knows that we can only accept 10 messages. It won't send more than 10 messages, uh, which is nice. So it's the year 2023. So before going into production with this amazing piece of code, I think it's safe to say that we should add encryption. RabbitMQ actually provides a GitHub repository to help you to create a root certificate 
or a, or a root CA and the certificates that you need to get going. So let's go ahead and open up a terminal. Now I'm going to clone the official RabbitMQ GitHub repository. They have a repository called TLS Gen. So go ahead, do that. We can go inside that repository and we should see a few files. There's something called the basic, which will generate basic certificates for you. So let's go inside the basic folder, tlsgen basic. Now you can read the readme here, the, where they explain what's going on and what's not going on. Let's just go ahead and create some basic certificates while we test things. So we're gonna do make password equals, and we're going to do make verify. And this will have gener generated a root CA and and all the files that we need to apply TLS. You need to change the permissions on these ones. Uh, you can read the readme if you really wanna know what all the commands are doing. But since this video is already way too long, I won't go into the details. Uh, but you should really read up if you wanna know all the internal workings on it. So let's go ahead and change the permission on the basic. The, the results will be restored in the results folder. Let's just go ahead and do, oh my bad, sudo schmod644 and we will do it on the results folder. So enter your password, boom, now we have the right permissions. We will need to delete the currently running RabbitMQ instance. I know, but let's do it, let's remove it. Goodbye Mr. RabbitMQ. So we need to reapply everything, but we're going to see how we can do that using configurations instead. And it'll be a lot easier, trust me. Go back to your project in the root. We will create a new file called rabbitmq.conf. This will be our configuration for RabbitMQ. We will need to mount this file into RabbitMQ when we start up RabbitMQ. When we mount it, we will need to make sure that the certificates that the TLS gen program yesterday generated for us. Do the same docker run command as before, but we will add a few things to it. So we will do docker run dash d dash dash name rabbitmq dash v for volume and we will use the current let's let me go back go back to the root make sure you're in the root otherwise it won't work. So once in the root let's do docker run again and let's name it the same as before. This time we will add the dash V flag, which is used to mount a folder from your host into the Docker container. And we will mount the rabbitmq.conf, which is the configuration file we have created. It's empty for now, but you know, mount it into slash etc rabbitmq rabbitmq.conf. Because that's where rabbitmq will expect the configuration to be. We will also make sure that we have read o and and once we have that we will add a second mount. This time we will mount the certificates that the script generated for us. To remove that. You can find these commands inside of my blog posts by the way. So if you kind of don't have the time or uh, don't want to pause all the time, you can find the commands in my articles. So let's mount the results folder into the slash search folder on the Docker container. This will make sure that the Docker container has access to the certificates that was generated for us. And again, we need to add the same ports as we did before, the port for the networking protocol and the port for the admin UI. And again, we will use RabbitMQ 3.11 management. Now, once this is created, we can start adding TLS configurations to the container. Let's go inside the configuration file. So I'm inside my RabbitMQ configuration file, which is now present also in the Docker container. So first of all, we want to disable any connections that isn't TCP. 
So listeners.tcp equals none. We want to make sure that it goes by default to the 5671 port when it's using SSL. Let's add the SSL certificates. So we will do SSL options. We will do dot CA cert file equals slash cert slash CA certificate dot pem. And these are the files that the script has generated for you inside the results folder server. And you need to make sure that you're using the right names. So I'm just going to go inside my basics folder in the results. And my computer is named black box. So these files will change name depending on the name of your computer. So make sure that you check the correct name whenever inserting these. So I will be using black box certificate dot pem. And I will add SSL options, key, the key file. The key file will be server black box key.pem. And we need to make sure that we are using peer verification. Now, peer verification is related to MTLS. I won't be going into MTLS and explaining the details here because, again, the scope of this tutorial is not that. Now we're going to add fail if no peer cert. Basically MTLS, okay, yes, short, is that the clients will also send out a acknowledgement uh, with their certificate, uh, allowing them to, uh, allowing both sides to send their certificate to verify their identities. So once we have done that, we have edited these, Basically, we have told RevDemQ where to found this, find the certificates. We have told RevDemQ to use SSL by default. And we have said that both sides of the communication should be using it. Now, let's open the terminal and do a clear first. Let's do docker restart RevDemQ. To make sure everything works, let's do docker logs RevDemQ to see the logs. And you should see what I'm seeing here started TLS listeners on 5671. If you're going into production and you're using your own certificates, simply skip the part where we generate the certificates and insert your own certificates to these locations. You mount the folder into search and then you add your certificates into this folder and you mount it using the volume as we did. We can really see if this works because we can close the programs that is running we can clear we can run the producer again and we should see a connection refused because we are not using the certificates right now so we need to update the code a little bit to use the certificates because the RevitMQ server is expecting encrypted traffic so we need to fix that the easiest way basically go into the RevitMQ we're going to modify the connection function because this is where the magic will happen. We will need new parameters. We'll need to add the CA cert, the client cert, the client key. If you are familiar with TLS, uh, I'm sorry if this is going a little bit fast. Um, I can't cover that really in details. Um, but if you want a video where we explain TLS in detail, let me know. We can do that. Um, I'm just going to return the error here. So we're going to read in the certificate file. Now we're going to load the key pair. And this is done using the, the, uh, the TLS package in Go. So load. This is the same regardless if you're using H. Uh, a regular HTTP client or whatever. Um, this is not related to RabbitMQ, how you load the certificates. So you should have seen this code before probably. Now let's add the root CA to the cert pool. And root CAs will be x509 new cert pool. And let's append 
the certificates. The ace. Append. Did I mistype? Yeah. Root C ace. We need to do append certificates from pem files because that's what we loaded. And then we will do TLS configurations. We will create a TLS configuration where we apply the root CAs that we have loaded. We will apply the certificates. TLS certificate. And we will insert the cert like that. So basically we load the key pairs we load the ca cert we create the certs um or we load them as certificates we append them and then create the tls configuration the tls configuration is important because when we dial amqp we have to tell it that we are using dial tls instead also we need to change the protocol it shouldn't be amqp anymore it should be amqp secure so add an S and you're fine. Then in the end of the dial TLS function, we also need to add the actual TLS config. So TLS, oh, I mistyped that. So let's, let's name it TLS config instead. TLS CFG. So make sure we add that to the dial TLS. I hope we don't speed this too much. Um, and I hope it's fairly understandable what's going on. So now we have changed the protocol. We have loaded the certificates. Now we need to update the consumer and the producer to also insert these right now. Now in my example, I will be using hard coded values to these certificates, the absolute paths. You should not in a real production. We will, I will be adding that because, um, I will be doing it the hard coded way because uh, it's actually a lot easier uh, and we don't want to be here all night looking at me just doing strange stuff so so i'm just gonna add the path to the results folder the first parameter is the ca cert so let's do the ca cert let's add a colon let's copy this three times or two times and let's just change the last parameter so we will update and we will use the client underscore black box certificate and the third parameter should be the key so let's add the black box key.pem and let's make sure we type that right so the ca cert the black box certificate and the and the key of course we need to update this on all the three play on all the places that we connect to the service and then of course i'm just gonna go ahead jump to the consumer copy paste that in the same thing let's see if this works like that so the consumer and the producer both are loading the certificates into this folder. Let's go ahead, jump back to the terminal and run it. Mm, we forgot to import something. So I'm going to go here, OS read file. I'm going to add the import to OS module. So we have all the imports managed. Let's go ahead and run again. Ooh, unexpected new line in argument in the producer. Missing comma in the producer. So let's go to the producer. Let's see. What is he on about? All right. My bad. I forgot a comma. <laughs> this is a really ugly connect method right now, but bear with me. Actually, I forgot the commas on the consumer as well. So we need to add that also like that. So one thing that we also need to change before connecting is the ports. So the TLS ports will be 71 instead. Change that. Change that for both the consumer and the producer. 51. 
And so if we run the producer now, when we have changed the ports, we have added the certificates and everything, go ahead and run it. And it will time out and tell us that the user pass is not allowed. So let's go ahead and do Docker logs. Rabbit MQ, you can see that the user Percy has invalid credentials. Now, why is that? Well, we have no infrastructure in place. Remember, we set up the permissions and the users and stuff using the command line terminal. Now, let's look at how we can use definitions to do that instead. Trust me, you don't want to ravage, manage RabbitMQ using the command line. It's going to be repetitive, it's going to be hard, it's going to be annoying. So, actually, there's a way to define configuration files for RabbitMQ in which we can define the virtual host, the users, the permissions, the exchanges to have, etc. Now, to do this, we need to begin by creating a hash of our password. So, I'm going to go and create a new script called encode password dot shell. I'm going to paste in a a, I'm going to paste in a script I found on Stack Overflow, actually. Now it's called encode password. Uh, I will have a link in the description, of course. Uh, what this does is that it encodes the password that you put here into the RabbitMQ defined algorithm. Uh, we will need the output from this. My password is secret, so I'm just going to use that uh, in here. I'm going to go ahead and open the terminal. And I'm going to do bash encode password. And I get this little string here, which is my encoded password. I'm going to copy that because we will need that now when we update the configuration. Inside RabbitMQ, the configuration, we will need to load a configuration file. So load configuration file on startup. Let's load definitions. This is called definitions, by the way. And we're going to place this in rabbitmq underscore definitions.json. We're going to need to create this definitions file for us, which we will use to define all the resources that we need. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file called rabbitmq underscore definitions.json. It's a JSON file. So it should be fairly straightforward what's going on. Now we can define users like I'm doing here. So let's create an array of objects called users. And we're going to have the name. The name is Percy. The password hash will be the output from the command that we ran before. And we want to add tags. Remember that we uh, added the administrator tag before. Uh, we can do that by simply using the tags field instead. Now let's don't forget commas. This is JSON. It will be angry. We can add virtual hosts the same way. So as you probably start to understand, this is a lot easier than using the command line terminal, the command line tools, but I really want to show you the command line tools because, you know, it's good to know. And we have a customer's virtual host. We want to set permissions. So permissions. The permissions will be an array again. And the permissions will be, uh, we can add many permissions here, but I will add a permission for the user Percy. And Percy will be targeting the customers in this permission. And I want to specify what permissions I have to configure uh, my write permissions and my read permissions. So basically, this is the same thing as using the command line it's just a lot smoother in my opinion and makes you it makes it easier to kind of maintain 
Um, so let's use the name. Let's call. Let's create a exchange. And as you see, if you know what the resources are called, it's pretty straightforward. So permissions goes into to the permissions exchanges exchanges. It's really straightforward. So let's create the customer events, the fan out. We want it to be durable. We want to auto delete false. We want internal to be false. We will add no arguments to the exchange. Oink. And then we will actually copy this and add a second exchange, which will be the callbacks. So we have a functioning. Uh, so we have a piece of software that actually functions after the tutorial so you guys can play more with it and uh, the callbacks should be a direct and everything should be false false we can create queues if we want to we are creating queues inside of the code right now but just so you know that you can uh, if you don't like for instance the customer is created Maybe I don't want that queue to be code generated. It should always be there, for instance. So there's no reason to have uh, the clients generate it. Um, sometimes it makes sense uh, using the RPC or the pub sub, for instance, it makes sense to have the clients generate the queues. But otherwise I like having um, the queues generated in the definitions file. So one last thing, we're going to add bindings. So you can have bindings pre-generated so that you know that these uh, that the stuff you want really works. Let's bind the customer events to the virtual host customers. And let's add a destination customers created. That's the routing key. Destination. Destina destination type is a queue. Let's fix the typo here. Destination. And let's go ahead and do the routing key. The routing key should be bound by customers created and a star like this i think this is it oh let's add the arguments as well just so we have everything to be honest i don't know if you need to add the arguments as empty or if it will crash we have created the definitions we need to bind this however so let's open up the terminal again i'm gonna do docker run i'm not gonna do docker run i'm gonna do docker container rmf rabbitmq i'm removing the docker container which is running rabbitmq right now i'm rerunning docker run and the reason for that is we need to add a third volume and that's the volume for the definitions you could mount the whole folder if you want i suppose or make it a little bit easier to mount everything but let's just do this for now. dvd slash rabbit mq definitions dot json. It should go into slash etc slash rabbit mq slash rabbit mq definitions dot json. Let's add arrow. And that's about it. Uh, I see a typo like that let's run it now after you restart it with the new volume you should be able you should be able to run docker logs rabbit mq and see the logs for the container if you scroll up you should see that successfully set the permissions etc for the user so we do know that the definitions were ran successfully so now that we have fixed everything we have fixed the configuration and the definitions. Let's go ahead and try the producer once more. And it's sending messages. 
Let's try one of the consumers and see if everything works as expected. Let's go back to the producer, send a few new messages, and everything is working. And everything is encrypted. And we have configured everything using configurations. So, sadly, this is the end of the tutorial. It's been a long one. It's been a really long one. I'm sorry. But it's been thrilling and exciting. So let's take a look at what we have learned. We have learned how to configure RabbitMQ, virtual host, create users, what permissions are, what permissions, and how you can create them. We have learned how to produce and consume messages on queues and exchanges. And hopefully it's really clear to you how to use connections and channels and the difference between them. And remember to reuse connections, but not consuming and publishing on the same connection. Reuse channels for each parallel process. So we have learned about RPC, how to use RPC using RepidMQ. We have learned about publish and subscribe and about the different exchanges, how to use TLS and how to configure it. And hopefully you have enjoyed this video. If you have, feel free to like and subscribe to my channel and I will hear from you. Thank you.